All right, so good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. We are so thrilled to welcome you to tonight's webinar on the work we've been doing with the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium, which is a digital humanities research and teaching community for ethnic studies fields. And we're pleased to be able to undertake our work with the funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The uh, PIs on the grant who are here are all are going to introduce ourselves. We're missing one tonight, um, but I am Rupika Rizam. I am a chair and associate professor of education um, at Salem State University. I, my role on this grant is as the director of the consortium. And I am joined by my colleague, Keja Valens at Salem State, who is unable to be here tonight, uh, who is the associate director of the consortium. And so what we handle is essentially all of the outreach, the management of the grant programs, the funds that we are trying to give out, the speaker series, the um, annual meeting we're gonna have uh, to share research and to make connections. And so that's what we're doing over at Salem State. Sonia, will you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Donaldson. I am an associate editor, or editor, I used to be an editor, professor at uh, New Jersey City University. Um, I think that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Tanisha? There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Tonisha Taylor. I am an associate professor and chair of communication studies at Texas Southern University. Great. And Jamila? Hi, everyone. My name is Jamila Moore Pugh. I'm an assistant professor of digital humanities and history in new media uh, housed in the Department of History at California State University Fullerton. And I would love to speak with anyone about digital things happening on the West Coast. Thank you all so much. So just to give you a very quick intro to who we are and what we do, um, the purpose of the Digital Ethics Futures Consortium is to um, run events, professional development, networking opportunities, and a re-granting program, our fellowship programs, to support the work of faculty, librarians, and students who are doing research at the intersections of digital humanities and one or more ethnic studies fields. Um, and so before we go into objectives, which I'll have Sonia talk about, the way this is largely working is that we have the consortium hub housed at Salem State, and then Sonia, Tanisha, and Jamila are um, the leads of their campuses where they're working on building up digital humanities um, at um, New Jersey City University, Texas Southern University, and Cal State Fullerton, and then also to help promote connections uh, within the region, within their regions, and trying to think about how can we together build up uh, digital humanities uh, in these fields. Sonia, would you like to take it away? Sure, and so when we got together uh, to think about sort of what uh, the digital humanities landscape looked like for our particular institutions and the communities uh, that these institutions serve, we decided that um, what we really wanted to do was not simply focus on sort of one thing, which is to like fund uh, a, a project or here or there, but to really think about uh, it sort of comprehensively. So thinking about developing and seeding uh, a network, a national network of social justice um, engaged DH practitioners, um, thinking about how we increase capacity and the DEF CON model really is focused on building, right? So it may very well be that uh, many of you are the only or one of a couple of people at your institution. And the DEF CON model really is about providing a national community um, of practitioners, educators, and folks who are 
um, sometimes isolated institutionally or spatially. Um, and then to think about our reciprocal and redistributive relationships, right? So thinking really um, in, in uh, about the communities uh, in which our institutions reside and the role that the institution can play in these communities through digital humanities um, um, and, and an engagement at the, at the level of the local. And then, next slide, okay. And the other thing is to think about the ways in which institutions um, sort of share spaces, again, with communities in which they um, reside. So we really wanted to think about resisting that sort of monodirectional um, approach in which the sort of university um, is sort of this benevolent, we hope, <laughs> uh, entity that serves the community, but really sort of reversing that and, and actually having so much of the work be dictated by what the community tells us that um, it needs um, and what community expertise is and listening and really respecting um, that, but also finding ways that we can collaborate on whether it's uh, issues related to the community or the ways in which community can inform the work that we do and how and what we teach. And then the final part is curriculum development and thinking about how we build the next generation of scholars. So we're starting at the undergraduate level, um, uh, developing curricula, but also training students, giving students the experiential knowledge that is really so necessary um, and grounded again in ethnic studies, um, grounded again in this idea of service to community and what community needs. Tanisha, can you start us off, please, talking about funding? Sorry, yes, I can. Um, all right, so talking about the funding, here we're looking at developing an organizational structure that works with national and across institutional work. A lot of times we talk about what that'll mean, but there's not a real clear way to do that. And so one of the things this project is really focused on is being able to provide mentorship uh, in the digital ethnic studies curriculum and community to be able to promote collaboration, um, acknowledge and, and create uh, knowledge mobilization and exchange in our digital humanities and ethnic studies fields uh, to be able to help individuals collaborate. The idea here is that we're going to share our strategies for success and how we successfully implement our uh, curricular initiatives on campuses, particularly for regional universities in the same state. They're often guided by the same state requirements. And so part of the idea here is that we'll create network opportunities, particularly for those within a given state so that they can work together uh, in order to understand the the structures that that we're all within um, and occasionally break out of those um, the next idea is that we'll provide financial support the grant provides financial support for the four key um, funders but we also want to be able to scale uh, our digital ethnic studies curriculum and projects so that we could be regional nodes uh, throughout the deaf deaf con uh, community. The idea is that we'll expand our capacity across our state, but also just across our regions. So for example, using um, Texas Southern as an example, our goal is to uh, expand across the state of Texas, but also specifically with the SWAC HBCUs, uh, those 13 campuses to be able to help uh, our partner institutions through regrants, uh, mentoring and curricular development uh, with faculty and librarians. So for our funding options, we will have teaching fellowships, capacity building fellowships, and mentorship funding opportunities. And Jamila? Oh, yeah. oh sorry, Tanisha, you want to continue? No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it's Jamila's turn. <laughs> no, Tanisha was brilliant, so 
I was just sitting back. Um, so yeah, so starting with um, teaching fellowships, I just want to point out, though, that as this grant, um, the larger Mellon grant was conceived, we all kind of talked about what our own experiences have been like. And so one thing that you'll notice is that all of these grants support your time and hours worked, um, because oftentimes you can get support for a project, but it doesn't necessarily translate into support for the project team. Um, and so these are all broken down. And if you visit the um, DEF Con website, you can see how $2,500 um, stipends supports a certain number of hours worked at the rate of $50 per hour um, for the project period. So um, the teaching fellowships, um, the first deadline coming up, um, the inaugural teaching fellowships is January 10th, and these are $2,500 stipends and assigned mentor um, to support development of courses that integrate knowledge of digital humanities with one or more ethnic studies fields. So that can be Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and or Asian American studies, or you could have a combination um, of ethnic studies fields um, enrolled in, in your teaching um, curriculum. Um, the teaching fellows will meet bi-weekly with an assigned mentor and have monthly meetings with a group of fellows um, that will be led by a DEF CON steering committee member. Um, eligibility for the teaching fellowships is um, for faculty and teaching librarians at public colleges and universities, excluding R1s um, in the U.S. and U.S. territories. Um, and the, the exclusion of R1s is really dedicated to going back to what my colleagues said, expanding the network and opportunities for regional comprehensive um, universities and also so that we can learn from each other because our structures of how we develop teaching and capacity building in our campuses are going to be slightly different from an R1. Um, and your final deliverable um, for this fellowship is a syllabus by September 1 of 2022. The next um, funding um, package that we have are capacity fellowships. Um, in this way, we see that someone may start off with a teaching fellowship and then maybe move on to a capacity fellowship. Um, but the capacity fellowships offer $5,000 stipends and an assigned mentor to support development of curriculum. So that includes minor certificates um, or, and whatever your heart's desire um, that integrate knowledge of digital humanities with one or more ethnic studies fields. Um, and additionally, I think there's a little more on capacity. Um, fellows will meet bi-weekly as well with an assigned mentor and have monthly um, meetups with a group of fellows led by a DEF CON steering committee member. Um, eligibility for the capacity fellowships are faculty and teaching librarians uh, at public colleges and universities uh, in the US and US territories. And the deliverable for this could include a curriculum map, course syllabi, um, and a governance timeline for the program being developed by September 1. Um, and so when you're thinking about capacity fellowships, think about who um, within your institution you might be able to collaborate with to develop um, some of these uh, uh, um, plans of study or curriculum maps, et cetera. Um, contingent faculty. So DEF CON will support the work of contingent faculty. Contingent faculty are eligible to apply for DEF CON teaching fellowships and contingent faculty are eligible to apply for DEF CON capacity building fellowships if they hold a role in which they participate in curricular development at their institution. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us um, through our humanities commons group um, the website, and even um, Twitter. Um, final um, funding um, is to support mentorship. Uh, we all know that mentorship is extremely valuable and important, especially when you're trying to build something new or you're building something and you haven't necessarily had a whole lot of support in the past. So we wanna provide mentorship. Um, DEF CON mentors, 
Uh, the, dan the deadline is slightly different from the other two. The deadline for DEF CON mentors to apply is January 15th. 2022. Um, and these are $2,500 stipends for 50 hours of support for fellowship recipients over eight months. So mentors would provide support for the uh, capacity building or um, teaching fellowships for a period of eight months. Um, mentors will offer support on topics such as curricular development, project management in the classroom, data management, sustainability of classroom digital humanities projects, and sunsetting, or how do you wind down a project? Uh, mentors will meet bi-weekly for an hour with their mentee and offer advice, review and on um, materials and feedback on syllabi assignments or curriculum design as appropriate. And the consortium director will also meet bi-monthly with mentors to then support their work. So everyone is getting supported at some level and um, eligibility to be a DEF CON mentor is to have digital humani humanities um, experience or to be a current digital humanities practitioner in the US or US territory. So membership in DEF CON, thanks to the support of the Mellon Foundation is free to become a member of DEF CON. Uh, all you have to do is sign up for our Humanities Commons group, um, which you can access through this through this link uh, on our website. Um, you can also optionally sign up for a, new, a newsletter uh, in which we can share uh, what's going on with you. You can follow us on Twitter at, at DEF Consortium um, and stay tuned for announcements of speakers, the virtual annual meeting, opportunities to meet colleagues and to share your work. So we now want to turn to questions and I'm going to stop sharing because we already have a bunch of questions. Um, trying to stop sharing. We have a bunch of questions um, in the chat that we can start answering. Okay, so all right, the first is only faculty from public universities, no private liberal arts colleges. So for the DEF CON teaching fellowships and the DEF CON capacity building fellowships due to how and why Mellon gave us the money. These are earmarked um, for public universities only, um, not, for, not for private universities. Um, so if you're at an HBCU that's private, you would not be eligible. If you're at an HBCU that's public, you would be, you would be eligible. Um, however, everyone can attend our annual meeting, our speaker series, and our other events, and anyone can apply to be a mentor. Okay, so we have one more question. To get a stipend, do I have to have a proposal ready? So we have an application um, that's on our website. Um, the application, uh, we could, should we walk through the application? Do you think that would be yeah, we could do that. Um, okay, let me just pull it up. Um, the applications are basically the same, um, except what they're asking is slightly different. Okay, so I have the application. So the application asks for your name, your institution, your title and your role, your department or departments, ask you to rate your experience level with digital humanities, to rate your experience level with Black, Indigenous, Latinx and or Asian American studies. Um, if you've taught a digital humanities course before, what topics did you cover? If you've taught um, Black, Indigenous, Latinx and or Asian American studies or ethnic studies before, what topics did you cover? a proposed course title, the department in which your proposed course will be offered, a question about whether your department will schedule you to teach the course next academic year, uh, and a 250 word description of the course you would like to teach. Um, Tanisha, would you like to go over the um, capacity building fellowship if I pull it up? Sure. 
Thank you. There we go. All right, so for the capacity building fellowship, um, as was noted, it's pretty much the same kinds of things, your name and institution, title, department, um, you're rating your level of experience uh, and how what your experience is with ethnic studies and how many digital humanities courses you've taught in the past. It's okay to say none, we understand. Um, what topic you have thought about teaching, um, what topics you've taught in ethnic studies, the proposed minor or certificate title, and we understand this is just a proposal, uh, and then which department would offer the, the certificate or the minor, and then a description of what is proposed in the program. So an idea about the number of classes you think would be included, if it's for undergraduates, graduate students or both, uh, how it would integrate into digital humanities uh, and, and ethnic studies on your campus, uh, and whether it includes community engaged in, uh, components in your, your area. Okay. So do digit uh, do let's see. Do applicants for teaching fellowships need to know how they will apply a digital humanities component? Could this be worked out during the development or mentorship period? Does anybody want to take that one? <laughs> Jamila, um, look for me to go. <laughs> I'll go. I tend to look before I leap anyway. So I um I would say that you should know what because you want to know how your project fits or how your proposed course fits into um, digital humanities um, teaching or pedagogy so you should have some idea about what it what you would like to do um, but I think the whole um, process of being mentored and, and having meetups is to really kind of hone then those ideas. And maybe you might even pivot slightly, but I would say, I would think about it as, um, as, as a whole picture as well, is not just having like um, a technical component or addition to the course, but how and why that technical component helps you to better understand um, questions that are relevant to um, ethnic studies. Um, and to kind of frame it together. I don't know if that was helpful. But. I think it was. Okay. <laughs> and the thing is, is digital human humanities, uh, people who teach digital humanities courses are often very good about sharing their syllabi online. So what I would suggest you do if you're completely new to digital humanities is to actually, um, take a look and see what people are doing in their courses. So you get a sense of what, of what kinds of things are out there. Also um, in my capacity um, on this grant, I'm also available to chat with, if you wanna talk through you know, what might work for a class or what kind of methods you might approach, I, I might take, you know, I'm happy to, to talk to people about that as well. Uh, let's see, we have, could I qualify as a graduate student? So graduate students can qualify so long as they're contingent faculty, they're teaching a course um, and the course uh, will be in, in the, at the intersection of digital humanities and ethnic studies. Um, it would be a bit more of a challenge, I think, for a graduate student to apply for a capacity building fellowship because of the needing to be able to have access to you know, governance, faculty governance and curriculum development, which uh, most graduate students don't have, of course, if you're, I mean, there's plenty of situations in which you may be a graduate student at one place and you may be a faculty member at another, and maybe you do have, um, are, are participating in, in curriculum development and governance, and in that case, you would be eligible. If you have individual questions about an individual case, um, the email for uh, our, um, for our initiative, um, I'm going to put it in the chat. It's also on the website. It's just digital ethnic futures at gmail.com. And you can send an email. I've been getting lots of emails from people saying, like, here's my situation. What do you think would work? And so I can answer those questions on a case by case um, basis. Uh, 
we also had, um, we have a question about teams and groups of faculty applying for capacity uh, grants. Um, yes, uh, we would only want, we would only be able to give out one to the team, um, but certainly teams can apply. Um, Sonia, you wanna take the course in Spanish? Sorry, what's the question? Uh, let's see, can I teach a course in Spanish? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. Short and sweet. Yes. We, no, we are the people who are like, yay, ethnic studies, but only speak English. <laughs> we are not. We are not absolutely, you know, there's, there's, there's great stuff that people are doing in language, in language courses or in um, not just language instruction, but also courses in, um, in Spanish upper level courses. And so, yeah, totally. Um, let's see. Can you team up with another professor who taught digital humanities courses? Absolutely. You can, we would only give out one um, stipend for that. Um, okay. There's a really great question. Uh, about could any of the coordinators share your experiences and teaching approaches in digital humanities and what the current needs in the field are. So maybe everybody could just kind of give a brief answer to this because I know we all do many different things. Tanisha, you look like you want to go first. Oh, sure. Um, so I am in communication studies. So in my area, I also already teach a lot of media studies classes. So I have taught classes in GIS mapping and narrative location, uh, where my students were trained to create uh, campus narratives and lock those to GPS locations across campus. Um, and then also I had a student who actually did create an app with one to three minute long mini documentaries tied to each GPS location. Um, really great project, loved that one. It was one of my favorite classes. Um, I think another one that I've done is to use tools in digital humanities, looking at um, black women's participation in social justice movements and the way that they've used uh, Twitter uh, to be able to advance social justice narrative and uh, do critical rhetorical analysis of social justice movements using Twitter. So my students have also enjoyed doing those kinds of projects as well. So those are a couple of the recent ones that I've done in digital humanities and taught through. Thank and I you. use it to teach research methods. Jamila, you wanna say a little bit about some of what you've been doing? Yeah, so I teach um, uh, classes in digital history um, in the history department. So we've done uh, classes that typically um, combine with larger or ongoing public humanities projects that I'm a part of. So I've had students participate in mapping public art um, using um, both uh, traditional mapping skills and also digital mapping skills um, throughout our region. Um, we are also right now developing a map of black businesses in Orange County um, that we'll do next semester. Um, I also teach an intro to digital history class, which includes different units in which we integrate different tools and uh, modules. Um, so we have a unit on critical digital pedagogy, which to the, the second part of that question about like what's needed in the field, I would definitely say more, um, more um, classes and opportunities to engage um, critical digital pedagogy or how we can use um, these tools in, in teaching um, instances to help advance um, ethnic study discussions on ethnic studies issues, um, such as, um, you know, thinking about um, how do digital archives contribute to um, kind of facilitating kind of post-colonial narratives? How do we use digital storytelling to invite new voices into, um, you know, uh, spaces? So I would say those would be some of the things that I'm kind of looking at developing on my campus. Um, and I've also taught a class in on humanities computing um, where uh, history students learn to code, which, <laughs> had varying um, levels of enthusiasm, 
But I would say that all of my um, instances in which I kind of integrate, I've even taught students how to do genealogical research um, using ancestry tools and other kinds of web genealogy tools. So um, it really, I just kind of look at the course and the questions and the learning objectives and then kind of see what would be kind of nice to have students try. Awesome. Sonia? Yes, I, I think I will just uh, echo um, both my colleagues. Um, I've, I've done quite a bit, um, anything from passive gaming to mapping using Google Maps and Google Earth. I teach a course called Reading Hip Hop and I have students map um, artists um, uh, uh, to, we're trying to create this sort of larger map of like hip hop globally, um, uh, looking at artists who typically don't get uh, recognition. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I've, yeah, primarily a lot of mapping, I guess more mapping than I realized <laughs> that I've done. I'm thinking about like um, Richard Wright's, I, I taught um, a course on black childhood and we mapped Richard Wright's um, uh, migrations and black boy and actually students presented their work at, at, um, at a conference. Um, in terms of needs, I would say that um, it's one of the things that I, one of the reasons I started teaching um, uh, digital tools and digital humanities very early on, like 2006 or 2007, we were actually doing podcasting and making short films back then. And we had internet radio. And so we were experimenting with quite a bit, but I saw the need for digital literacy. Um, and so I think I'd sort of moved away from that, but I think I've come back to it as I see again that students actually need a, a, to develop a deeper understanding of where we are um, in terms of our relationship technology. And so my very early course was um, technology and identities, which led me to um, you know, developing um, other um, courses, but I'd say I think a move back to literacy is is something that I think is is also really necessary. And I'll just jump in and say, students love maps. They love maps. They love putting things on maps. They love having their mind blown about all the lies you can tell with a map. They love being shown the West Wing clip about the maps um, about the um, Mercator projection being wrong. They love it. Yeah. I have taught a bunch of classes in digital humanities. I've taught a class um, on the digital Black Atlantic um, in which uh, I was introducing students to different projects, um, actually projects by all of the people here. Uh, well, all of my, my uh, co-PIs, <laughs> that is not everybody in this room, um, but Sonia, Jamila, and Tanisha, um, and introducing them to different methods, to mapping, to textual analysis, to creating an archive, to creating a, an edition. And when I was teaching this class, I actually didn't think I would have them do a project. I just wanted them to prototype ideas for projects and be unfettered by the practicalities of implementation. And then they said, but we want to do one. And so I ended up scraping the second half of my syllabus and we together, we went to the university archives and we identified a really interesting point in our history, um, which was when the university newspaper published an Eldridge Cleaver novella and the newspaper got censored and destroyed by the president of the university. And it turned into this landmark court case about the censorship of college newspapers. And so the students did a digital exhibit about that. And they each found these different sort of areas they wanted to work on. Some wanted to connect it to the, to the present. Some wanted to do an edition of the novella. And they did all these different pieces and put it together and made a project. I also routinely teach um, a digital writing course, which has a social justice angle. So we talk, we do podcasting, we do mashup videos, we do social media analysis, all with an eye towards how do we use these different forms of media um, to advocate for um, anti-racist social justice. So there are lots of different um, approaches you could take. If it's not too tacky to show for the book that brought all of us together, uh, although it's not really shilling because it's open access and freely available um, <laughs> online, the Digital Black Atlantic, um, edited by me and Kelly Baker Josephs, um, is available free um, through University of Minnesota Press. So you can get, there's so many, there's so many different methods and 
we cover a lot in that book. Hmm. All right, we have a question about what is digital humanities? <laughs> like, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, I can give you my, actually somebody emailed me today and asked me that, which was really interesting. And so um, here is what I would say, and please feel free everybody to dis disagree with me. I would say it's using digital and computational tools, like maybe a map, creating a digital archive, creating a digital edition of a text, using a tool um, that would, you know, you could put in a text and it gives you a word cloud to show you word frequency and other aspects of the text that are slightly more complicated to explain. Um, to study history, literature, and culture. And then on the other side of that, taking all of our knowledge about how to analyze culture that we get out of a background in the humanities and applying that to digital platforms, like how does Twitter work or to digital objects like a TikTok uh, and to digital cultures. Like Tanisha has a great article on um, Black Twitter, for example, in, um, in Digital Black Atlantic, Jamila has a wonderful article about historical reconstruction uh, work and digital mapping, and Sonia has a wonderful uh, chapter on um, her work on um, digital sort of digital ephemera media representations um, of Lift Every Voice and Sing. So uh, mm. that would be my answer. Anybody else want to uh, add anything? <laughs> this is like the hardest question ever. I know. <laughs> I would say, you know, one of the things if you never done digital humanities work before or encountered it. One thing to keep in mind, I think starting with Sonia said is, you know, the precursor to that is just having digital literacy, understanding, you know, how to navigate um, uh, digital um, mediums. Um, and that's something that a lot of our students, um, I agree, you know, really, really do need. The other thing is to think about it as it's a collaborative way of building knowledge as opposed to maybe some of our disciplines where we learn to kind of go out there and go it alone. Um, so I would say I would just add that part is that, you know, it's, it's very collaborative. A lot of the work that I do involves bringing people into my classroom um, to work with us as well. I would, I would, it gives you an opportunity to do things big on a bigger scale than you can um, just one-on-one, -on -one, right? So in communication, I'm trained as a rhetorician. So I'm trained to look at like one speech act and analyze that one speech act. But using digital tools, I can look at, for example, every presidential state of the union address that's ever been given in the United States since the very first one and compare, look, compare all of those using digital tools across time and space to look for specific themes, right? Um, and so that's one example of, of something you can do. I would never do that doing coding that by hand because it would take too long. Also, I don't care that much about presidential state of the union speeches, but that's separate. <laughs> I would also add that if we're thinking about digital humanities at the sort of intersection with ethnic studies that it is also about um, the community and um, it's also about creating work that serves uh, the community in meaningful ways, whatever that community looks like, wherever you are. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, great answers. I have a question, can I say something? Yes. <laughs> uh, because I'm not sure if you saw my question, hello. My name is Olivera Stenkovic. I teach at the I taught the Antis, but I call collaborative international learning. I'm not sure if you ever heard about them. So I don't know it does have that uh, digital literacy uh, thing uh, embedded. We also use different digital medium like a Slack and Padlet and Facebook and Twitter, and we discuss, like Sonia mentioned, all these topics we discuss with students across the globe. So this time I paired NJCU students with Mexico, South Africa, and we do we use the same these themes we just use across the border. So I'm just curious if we call if we can qualify with this kind of grant, because uh, what I'm doing I'm mostly volunteer. I don't have uh, support financial support. Mm -hmm. 
but it's very interesting because you are doing about you're talking about your community but also talking about uh, comparison and conscious analysis with another community in another another country using the same like talking about the same issue right i'm familiar with coil because my a lot of my colleagues participate in it so i do know the model um mm -hmm. as if the topic of the course fits mm -hmm. within digital humanities and ethnic studies then absolutely it would be eligible for a grant but if it's just you're, it's just because it's a coil course it wouldn't no, 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 I like your topics. That's what I'm saying. It will be awesome to so use the topic. Topics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like right. about ethnicity, about uh, racism, and all these things. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it fits with people. Topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. I really like that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we have other questions. All right. So, as that new course proposal is allowed, absolutely. We really want, if especially, we were hoping that people who haven't tried, you know, integrating these these two um, areas of study before would be willing to try. I have a question from um, Shiloh. I'm a PhD student. Can I apply with a librarian and co-write a syllabus and co-teach a course? I think absolutely. Um, um, oh, we have a question from Kara about ah, folks at universities that are technically R ones, but not really. Okay, so I think this is a case by case situation. In the case of your university, you actually have no graduate programs in the humanities and have a very different. Um, situation and um, so this is a I think a case by case we went with straight avoiding our ones because we don't want faculty this is going to sound terrible but faculty who already have access to a lot of resources don't need our money we want to be able to share the resources with um, faculty instructors who don't have access to it so this is very much a you know contact us and let's like figure out if this would be appropriate or not situation um, bonus points for being a minority serving institution or um, an H a Hispanic serving institution, emerging Hispanic serving institution, an HBCU, um, and uh, you know, an Asian American serving, native serving institutions. Um, let's see. Um, so you don't have to have digital. This is Olivia's question of I don't have experience in digital humanities, but I did collaborate collaborative national learning, you don't have to have digital humanities expertise to apply. Um, you have to should have some idea of what is digital humanities and what is in the remit of ethnic studies in your course. Um, but actually you can use the time to develop the knowledge and expertise of how you would implement it in a course. Is that um, co copies? Is that aligned with what you're thinking or would you add anything? No, I think that's good. That makes sense. Uh, we have a question. If we are graduate students in R1, can you be mentors? Yeah, the R1 thing is not apply to mentors. Um, naturally, if we have mentors who are from universities that are more similar to ours and their, their expertise matches the needs of the fellows, we would prioritize that. But uh, I, don't, I don't really think we're going to actually get so many more mentors than applicants that that would actually end up being a problem. Um, Jamila, thank you for answering these questions. Ah, okay, here's an interesting question. Could the coordinators give suggestions for making a pitch for digital humanities courses and curriculum to our universities? And some examples. Um, so one thing on examples, I will just um, point you to, I mean, I'm just shilling for myself tonight. Uh, the journal that I co-edit, um, Reviews in Digital Humanities, we have a project um, registry and that looks at the projects that we've reviewed and people do a lot of mapping projects with students. Um, so there's just a lot of links in there. It's just that there's not really a directory of digital humanities projects. Um, so. This is like the closest I can give you to um, being able to um, find a list of projects to look through to see what might work. Um, so let me just do that. And how have the rest of you made a case or, you know, sometimes not making a case, sometimes it's just doing digital humanities at your institutions. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's just always doing. <laughs> um, so I don't, 
uh, you know, I, as with a lot of folks at similar institutions, I think um, Jamila um, and Tanisha, you can also, I think, chime in that there are not a lot of us. <laughs> and, um, and so I think uh, there really is uh, then the opportunity to just do and hopefully folks can come along with you. I typically um, work on students and I've been really fortunate in that we actually have surprisingly an amazing GIS lab thanks to one of my team members who has worked hard over the years to get funding to set. So we have a full on like Esri <laughs> uh, research one level GIS lab at NJCU, which is our little secret. And he's been, Bill Montgomery has been working with students over the years to build their own small GIS projects. Um, but, and we've collaborated um, on an honors course that we built together across three faculty members. Um, and so it really is a matter of trying to, doing it yourself, unfortunately, <laughs> which is difficult, but also trying to find people at your institution who are at the very least open uh, uh, to listening and are willing to kind of experiment a little bit with you. So it really is about the community building aspect of it uh, because most of us are, um, you know, the only or small in numbers at our institutions. Yeah, I would just agree that, you know, a lot of it is just kind of leaping in and doing. Um, lucky for me, my department was looking for someone to do this, hence my title <laughs> is, and I keep that in the title because I want to remind people if should they forget, hey, you wanted me to do this stuff. So when I come around looking for resources, they know. Um, but I think the other thing, but it has still been a challenge to get to make kind of the pitch for um, digital humanities broadly, not just digital history, which is one house in the digital humanities. Um, and so that's where, as Sonia said, developing partnerships with um, folks who are, you know, interested in, in, you know, all kinds of different topics that touch upon the digital um, in the university library um, or people who, you know, run other labs or spaces that we can kind of collaborate with has been really important in terms of showing that this is not just me and my pet project, but this is something that is beneficial to the campus at large. Um, another key thing has been, I think, rooting my, 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 my courses and my curriculum in the community. Um, so starting off with Mapping Arts OC, where we look to map public art in one city in Orange County. And from there, students started coming in, community partners started coming in, and we've had to since, re, you know, we're currently redesigning and expanding the project. Um, and so um, having people within the university see that this is, again, not just kind of my little pet project, or, um, but this is something that the community wants. Um, they want to see their stories told in these different ways. Um, and, and it kind of gets us also outside of the walls of the academy um, has been really good for kind of making the case, I would say. I would um, jump in and say that, you know, they didn't want, I mean, they didn't know that there was going to be a digital humanist. Uh, they were hiring something else and surprise. <laughs> I really just wanted people to work with and I wanted um, I wanted colleagues. Um, so I essentially went to the library and I was like, who's here? And the archivist had lots of arch archival treasures and an interest in digital humanities, um, but hadn't necessarily done very much with it. And so we got to know each other Actually, we met at a union lunch and she had she had shepherded one of my internal grant applications through our granting um, committee. And so she, I sat down next to her and she goes, I know you. 
I know you're doing a, pro you want to do a project. And so we started to talk and we became friends. And so what we then did was try and identify other colleagues who might be interested. Um, we tried to look for internal funding sources. So we were able to apply for um, a strategic plan uh, grant. It was tiny. It was like $7,500 um, to pilot an an interpaid internship program for undergraduate students um, to learn digital humanities, to give them research opportunities. So our students don't have a lot of research opportunities. Um, we also, what else did we do? Oh, we tried to see what internal things already existed that we could try and appropriate and repurpose for ourselves. So for example, we always had, you could apply to run a faculty learning community. And so we twice ran digital humanities faculty learning communities and brought, and they were paid opportunities for faculty to develop professional in some area. And so we ran two of those. And so that was sort of how over time we um, managed to build up our program. So a lot of kind of find your people um, and starting with the library is really good. Um, and also kind of recognizing that librarians have expertise um, in their areas and that um, librarians are not there to serve faculty and you know, cult cultivating really equitable um, relationships on the basis that, you know, I come with some expertise, you have some other expertise. Together, we make things um, that are fun and collaborative, uh, that emphasis on collaboration. Um, that's how we did it. And I can share, I have two chapters, I think they're available um, on our digital commons repository on what we did at Salem State and how we did it. So I'll drop those links in the chat in case people want to uh, read our recipe. Um, okay, Kathy Harris suggests that the volume free and open access digital pedagogy in the humanities would be great for people who are interested in learning more about teaching digital humanities. I completely agree. Um, and not just because I wrote a chapter. It is actually very, very, very useful um, resource and the links in the, the chat. Um, I would add if you've never, especially if you've never taught digital humanities classes, it's really helpful. Um, again, not just because I wrote something in there, but um, I've used it to try and figure things out myself. There's lots of really great like lesson plan resources in there and other kinds of resources that um, syllabi and all kinds of stuff in there. It's, it's a lifesaver. I've gone to it just when I can't think of what to teach because my administ my administrative brain spent too much time working and didn't give my teaching brain enough space to breathe. Great. And then how many slots are available in each category? Oh, I have to look that one up. My understanding is it's 20 teaching, we've budgeted for 20 teaching fellowships in year one and I want to say 10, 10 capacity building fellowships in year one. And then theoretically over the years that shifts as we hope that more people who got a teaching fellowship, you know, this year might be interested in, in applying for a capacity building fellowship um, next year. So the number of capacity building goes up and the number of teaching fellowships slightly goes down. This is also, you know, all hypothetical. So, you know, we may see what we're getting in terms of demand and then ask Mellon if we can change our um, budgeting and if we need more of one kind of grant or another. Um, samples, like samples of what, Olivia? Oh, you're muted. Oh, lesson plans. I think digital pedagogy in the humanities is great, is absolutely great. I mean, there's syllabi, there's lessons, there's everything you could possibly want. It's a really wonderful volume. Yeah, there's lots of activities and they're specific to each word or phrase, which is also helpful. So like if you're used, looking for things specifically for like social justice, there's I bring that one up, not because it's the one I wrote, but because it's the one I remember. Um, there's also one, I think there was actually one in friendship too that I used for my interpersonal class, but yeah. So there's all kinds of, 
all kinds of terms related to digital humanities. I used to teach interpersonal. That was one, one of my favorite courses. Oh, so, nice. oh, I'm so happy to see this. I love it. Great. So are there any more questions? We have about two minutes. Oh, when will we announce the recipients? January 24th is the answer. So just to wrap up, please let us know what you need, particularly at Salem State in collaboration with the steering committee, which is Keisha, Valens, and I, Sonia, Jamila, and Tanisha. We are deciding, you know, what are we going to do for speaker series, what kind of networking events, opportunities, and what we're going to do at our annual meeting. So I would absolutely love if you drop a note to that digital ethnic futures at gmail.com email and tell us what you need in order to do this work. And we will try to use the resources that we have to be able to make that possible because we really um, are approaching this with the idea that we want to be in community with other colleagues working um, in these areas and not, you know, we want to all do this together. Absolutely. So thank you so much for being here, for staying for the hour. We are very excited um, to see all of you. We hope that you will apply um, either um, by the 15th of January for a mentorship or by the 10th of January for a fellowship. And we also hope to see you at our future events. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a Everyone. great day. Good night. I'm going to save the chat because there are a lot of good questions, and maybe I can make an FAQ and put it on the website. That'd be awesome. I think that's probably smart. Uh, let's see. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for this webinar. It was really, really cool. And I'm not sure that I will qualify for any of the fellowships, but honestly, I just want to find a way to be involved in a DEF CON one way or another through events or through honestly, like anything. I have never seen that many people teaching DH in the same uh, Zoom room. So this was um, a very heartwarming moment for me. And uh, just wanted to say thank you for all the resources. That I've opened all of the links and I'm going to go through all of them. So thank you so much um for all of your work thank you and to make sure yeah. you find the humanities commons group and the email and we'll send up more information thank you so much have a wonderful evening thank you Bye. welcome good night bye, bye justine <laughs>